Before we go any further with functions, we have to spend a bit of time introducing how functions are run inside of code. So we'll go through some more detailed and somewhat more cruel function tracing exercises later. If you scroll down, you can take a look at those. Uh, but at the very beginning, we have to talk about what it means to use a function, and we have to talk about what it means to create a function. So I've put, on this, uh, I've put up here uh, on the screen uh, an example of a function that's defined, and it, it does, I mean, it's sort of useless. It doesn't do anything useful, but it does something just opaque enough. It's not obvious what it does, that maybe it's a good example for tracing. And my goal is eventually, I just want to give the one line of output that's going to be produced by this printf statement. So we know that in any C program, um, when we begin, we start at the top of main. And maybe you noticed a quite a striking similarity between the function we saw in the previous video and this function and main itself. Main does look a lot like a function, and it turns out that it actually is. Main is a regular function with only one special privilege, which is that it is the very first function called when any C program starts. But it is actually just a regular function in every other sense. So up here I have a function. I've called it my function. And we should begin taking a look. Uh, if you scroll down on the page you're watching this, you'll see in the notes uh, it talks in great detail about a function body and a function signature. This whole thing is a function definition. And the definition of the function my function has this signature. So uh, the signature can be broken up into three parts. And the parts are, the very first thing, sort of confusingly, is the return type. And that is, what kind of thing will the function be sending back? And we'll see that you can have a function that sends back a value in any type you want. We'll actually see in the next video, it is absolutely fine to have a function that sends back nothing at all. Um, here we have the function name. And over here, we have the parameter list. I generally use the terms parameter and argument interchangeably. There is a bit of a difference, which is when you define the function, so that's what's happening up here, you typically, if you care about the distinction, would call the parameters formal parameters. Int a, well, we don't have a value for a yet. a is something that will be assigned when we use the function. So formally, it's just a parameter. Uh, when I eventually use the function, when I call the function, we call the things that we really pass in, the actual numbers we provide, the actual parameters. Although I've noticed the last few times I've taught this course, that distinction is basically useless. But there it is just in case we care. Um, and you will, of course, need that distinction in higher level courses, but they'll get back to it at that point. So altogether, this first line here is the function signature. And it's supposed to provide everything from a programming standpoint that is needed to use the function. It might not provide enough information to programmers about what the function is meant to do, but it should provide enough information, for example, to the compiler that when you use the function, it understands what the function means. For example, if I want to call this function, I need to provide one parameter, and that'll be what ends up being called a. And the function will be called my function, and it will send back an int value. Okay, so that's one thing. And that entire segment at the top, let's just back this whole thing up, that entire segment at the top is the function definition. Now we'll see later that there's also something called a function declaration, which is similar and also involves the function signature, but we'll just, we'll leave it for now. We'll start slow. So this allows the program, after I define the function, anywhere below this in my code, I can use the function. We call that a call. So this thing over here is a function call. Actually, I'm going to, there's probably, there's more than one of them. So um, let's see, this and this are both examples of function calls. And they are uses of a function. And the point of this video really is actually to explain when the code is running, how do we handle this? What does it mean to use a function in the context of, let's say, an arithmetic expression? And we can see we have a couple here. The, the expressions I'm using for y and z uh, involve calls to these, um, these functions. Let's just get rid of that. Whoops, I guess I didn't get rid of all of it. Um, 
So let's trace this code and let's get the output. Okay, so I'm gonna begin at the start of main. Now, what we're gonna notice is that we jump around between different scopes because maybe it's maybe you've noticed that main has these curly brackets and there they are. That's the scope of main. But if ever I need to use my function, I end up up here outside of the code for main and that's very significant. And that's why we talked about scope at the end of last week. So let's begin our trace. I'm going to begin my trace by drawing my scoping diagram. I'm going to draw a nice big box for main, although I don't need as big of a box as I might usually need because um, I notice there are no other scopes. I have no while loops or anything. Okay, so then I get to, I should really number these lines. I get to this line here and uh, we've got a variable called x and it's an int and its value is 10. Okay, so all good so far. Um, okay, then the next line int y. So I'm going to make a variable called y, but then I have an assignment statement. And we know already that to evaluate this assignment statement, what I should do is ignore the entire left-hand side and just uh, hack away at the right-hand side. So what do I want to do? I want to call my function. Before I can call my function, I have to have the value that I'm going to pass in. And I don't have that yet because there's still this, this unknown. So x minus 5. Well, I have to work that out. So x minus 5, let's see. Uh, x has the value 10. If I subtract 5 from that, that ends up just equaling 5. Okay, so I'm calling my function and I'm giving it the value 5. When you call a function, the value you pass in in the brackets, they get matched up with the values of each, with the uh, names of each parameter. In this case, there's only one parameter. So we sort of know that the 5 is going to end up becoming the parameter a. But how do we trace it? Okay, so here's what happens. I'm going to just... Um, back up some of my diagram here. We know that we're calling it with the value 5. So what we do at this line of code, we put main on pause because we're about to let my function run instead. We go on our scoping diagram and outside the box for main, this is critical and we'll see why in a future video, outside the box for main, we create a new scoping box for my function. There it is. And we draw a big box for it. And one thing you should observe is the reason we draw the box outside the box for main is that the curly brackets for this scope are actually outside of main. They, they aren't inside the curly brackets for main. So by the rules of scope, this scope isn't inside the scope for main. Um, it's an extremely common mistake that people make. I have a feeling it's because they're not using diagrams to not notice that distinction. But as I said, future videos will talk about this in great detail. Okay, the next thing we do, we're not even ready to start our function yet. We've drawn a box for it. The next thing we do before we start the code for the function is we add to our diagram for the function scope a box for every one of its parameters. And what you'll notice is the box that I draw is exactly the same as a local variable for that function. And that's significant. It turns out that once the function starts, int a will behave exactly like any other variable. The only thing special about int a is that it was a parameter, which means it'll get a value when the function starts. Okay, so I've drawn out the parameter and now I pass in the value 5. So when the function begins, a already has the value 5. So what I've done is I've made the scope for my function, I've created a box for on the diagram for each of its parameters, and I've given those parameters their initial values. And now I am ready to actually go to this line and start. Okay, so the first line of my function is int p equals 2 times a. So I'm inside of this scope right now. So I create a box for p, there it is, it's an int, 2 times a. Okay, that's an assignment statement, let's actually work that out. Ignore the left-hand side, 2 times a would be 2 times 5, that's 10. So put the value 10 in p, okay. And then, uh, let's see, the next line, int q. So I make a new box called q. I don't think I'm going to go through this in the greatest detail, maybe you can see what's going to happen. Int q equals negative p, int q equals negative 10. Okay, so now we reach this line, return q. Now, you haven't worked with return statements too much, although there has been this thing all semesters so far we've seen this, but we haven't really given it much attention. Up here, we're at return q. Okay, so return q. How do we evaluate this? The first step is take the right-hand side of the return statement and work it out until it's one number. In this case, it's easy because q is negative 10. Okay, I am returning the value negative 10. So here's what you do. When you hit a return statement, you take that number, you go back to where the function was called, which is here, and you replace the call with the number. So I replace this with negative 10. 
Okay, so I, I keep track of that. This is called the return value of the function. The function sent back the value negative 10. And then when the return statement is finished, it doesn't matter when you hit this return statement. As soon as you hit the return statement, you make a note of the return value, and then the function ends. And that means, well, let's erase all this stuff. But that means that like anything else, the function scope is absolutely destroyed. The function is now over. There is nothing left. You do not see any of this wreckage ever again. And in fact, what I should do is now delete it. Let's just do this. I'm using a different drawing program today, and it's got its own set of problems, apparently. I have to circle stuff to get rid of it. There it is. That scope is gone. OK, so when the function ends and I'm done with the return statement, then I end up back in main. And last, thing I, last time I checked in main, I was, oh, I better delete this. Um, I was sitting inside of this assignment statement. So just to clean up my diagram, this thing here had been replaced with the value negative 10. That was that return value from the function that I called. So I set y to be negative 10 inside of main. OK, so that's the end of that line of main. I'll do one of these weird circle things again. Uh, OK, so I get, to line, I get to this line here. So it's an assignment statement. And so I ignore this, and I try to evaluate the assignment statement. OK, so it's going to be 2 plus 3 times this thing. OK, so I guess I have to evaluate what's inside the brackets first. So I take x minus 7. So in main, the value of x is 10. So 10 minus 7 is 3. Now I'm going to call my function with the argument 3. OK, so I go over here. I draw a new scoping box. I call it my function. There it is. And I create a variable on inside the scope for each of the parameters of my function. So int a, I assign the first parameter is a, and it gets the value 3. OK, good. And now that I've set up the box, I have the scope, I have all the parameters, now I am ready to start executing the function. OK, so int p, I create a variable called p. There it is, equals 2 times a. So 2 times a would be 6. It's an int. And then next line is int q equals negative p. So q would be negative p, int q, negative 6. And then I return the value of q. So I go back to the function call. That was this. And I replace the whole thing with the value of q, which is negative 6. OK, and now that I've hit a return statement, the function ends. And that means the scope is gone. I forget everything about it. Nothing about it survives except for that return value that I sent back. And I do this weird, awkward circling thing again. All right, scope's gone. Um, maybe we'll get rid of some other stuff while we're at it. There we go. Oh, I didn't circle that correctly. This is, uh, I kept complaining about the other drawing program. This isn't the best, I think, either. but. It's a, at least it's different. Variety is the spice of life. OK, so now I'm, I've done, finished calling the function. I've got negative 6. And now I just keep working out the assignment statement. OK, so negative 6 plus 1, that would be this whole thing comes out to negative 5. OK, so 3 times negative 5 would be negative 15. OK, so I just cross this whole thing out. So it's 2 plus negative 15. OK, 2 plus negative 15 would be negative 13. So over here in main in my diagram, z has the value, uh, whoops, negative 13. And then I get down to this print statement, and the output is x is. And notice that there were a lot of variables flying around in my program. But now that I'm at the end, it's pretty obvious what x is. In this scope, x is 10, y is negative 10, and z is negative 13. So that's a basic example of how to trace through code that involves functions. The key points to remember are that when you call a function, the first thing you do is work out the value of each parameter. Then you draw a scoping box for that function, add every one of the parameters to the scoping diagram, and then you begin, and then you, I guess, you set the parameter. So in this case, for example, we had uh, the value 5. That would get assigned to A, and then you execute the code for the function in the new scope you created. Whenever you hit a return statement, and you could, for, for whatever reason, you could hit a return statement before you've gotten to the end of the code for the function. But as soon as you hit a return statement, you send back that value, and the scope is destroyed. Um, and then you just keep working as usual. You use the result of the function just as if it were any other number in your program. Uh, I have the code for this example um, separately in our lab environment. Let me just go 
Let's flip that over. So one thing we should observe is that in practice, when you have functions that do something that isn't obvious, in this case, I think the reason it's not obvious is because I've given it a sort of dumb name. I should, I should give it a different name that's more self-explanatory. What we often see is that uh, we'll put what's called a header comment in front of every function to explain what's going on so a programmer can understand it. Um, and so I have the entire example here. First, let's run it to see whether the output that I gave a minute ago actually is the output the program produces. There we go. Um, we run it. X is 10. Y is negative 10. Z is negative 13. OK, great. So that's one thing. The next thing I want to illustrate is that inside of a function, so in the function body, we can put any code we want. And we might already know that because main is a function. And all the code we've learned so far, we were able to put inside of main, which is a function. So I can put any code I want up here as well. For example, I could even put something like inside my function, and we'll print out everything we know. A is something, P uh, is something, and Q is something. And I guess I should also tell printf what I want to print, A, P, and Q. So we'll save that. We'll try running that just as an experiment. I really encourage you to try experimenting with this example yourself. Um, okay, my display is working a little bit strangely today. I guess I'll have to look into that before the next video. But we can see the first time I call my function, a is 5, p is 10, q is negative 10, then a is 3, p is 6, q is negative 6. I also want to show this. So I mentioned a minute ago, sort of ominously, whenever I hit a return statement, the function ends. That means if I end up down on line 19, um, or sorry, that means that if I have code on line 19, I'll just print out line 19. If I have code on line 19, there's no way I can actually get to it because I have to get to line 18 first, and that's a return statement. And if I ever get to line 18, the function ends. Let's prove that. I won't see anything in my output that says line 19. And you can see here, nowhere in my output does it say line 19. And that's significant. Um, and we'll notice that there are reasons why you could have multiple return statements inside a function. Uh, and if you ever hit any return statement, the function is immediately over. And one final point is that what I put on the right-hand side of my return statement can be any expression. It does not actually have to be um, just one variable. And so what you might observe is what's actually happening in this function is you give me a value a, and what's actually being returned is negative 2 times a. So it would be perfectly valid to just write return and I mean, this would actually be the logical thing to do, frankly, because the extra variables don't really help anything. It would be perfectly valid to return negative 2 times a in one fell swoop. And you can see, I still get the same output. Now, what I should caution people about here is that doesn't mean you need to try and torture yourself to make each function one line long. It is absolutely fine to write a function that has 10 lines and creates extra variables. A lot of people get superstitious and say, oh, isn't the extra variable going to make things slower? Don't worry about that. It's likely not going to happen, for one thing, but it's important that we save human time. If it takes you less time to understand the code with extra variables, use extra variables. Even if it did slow the computer down to use extra variables, human time is worth more than computer time. So we've seen the basics of how to trace functions. And don't worry if you're still shaky on the specifics. We'll see lots of more detailed examples of that. My hope was that this example was enough to understand when we call a function, how does the code jump around? When we call this function, we go up here, we run everything inside, and then we come back. And what ends up coming out of this, so the number I end up using here, is just whatever the function returned. Now that we've seen that, we can do a few more exercises involving writing functions, and that big, and the M word, modularity, and then we can come back and trace through some more complicated things.